Welcome to Electric Liberty Land here on the Lions of Liberty podcast, your weekly shot of culture, comedy, and liberty with your host, Brian McWilliams. Good morning out there in Electric Liberty Land, everyone. Thank you for joining me this morning. And once again, for the second week in a row, I am actually recording in the morning, which means that there's going to be little clouds that have to clear before the sunshine comes out. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and also, my voice, as last week, is going to take a little while to uh, to loosen. So if you like gravel in your ears, you can look forward to that for the next 15, 20 minutes. So at the top of the show today, I want to remind everybody that this is episode 13, which means that you can go to lionsofliberty.com forward slash ELL 13. And I can have all the show notes there for you, including some references to a recent episode of Tom Woods on the show, which Mark, of course, does his in-depth interviews on Mondays. He had Tom Woods on to discuss a lot of different uh, issues, including one that's like a callback to the first time Tom was on the show, but also looking at a quote unquote safe space for libertarians. And uh, yeah, anyway, fascinating conversation as always with Tom. On Fridays, we got John Odermatt with Felony Fridays looking at the criminal justice system. Make sure you don't miss that. Also, follow us on Twitter at Lions of Liberty. You can join our Facebook forum. Just type in Lions of Liberty Forum on Facebook. If you don't look too crazy, we'll let you right in. and Like us on all the other platforms we got. You know that kind of stuff. And, of course, support the podcast. We've got t-shirts at lionsofliberty.store. We also have our Podbean patron program, which you can support uh, by throwing a few shekels at us. We've got different levels to join at. Gives you some discounts on some product that we have. And also, you can take part, depending on how much you want to support the show, you can also get in on our calls. We have a private group. We have some calls once a month with them. There's also exclusive content that comes out. It's a great time. Give us some feedback. You can tell me personally to shut up in real time, which I know is worth a lot of money to a lot of people. So just remember that you can go there to go to lionsofliberty.com forward slash support. All right. So at the top of the show today, I want to first things first, take a look at what's going on with the House Intelligence Committee Chairman Devin Nunes. I believe that's how you pronounce his name. I uh, <laughs> I don't know for sure because I don't watch too much radio or TV from the mainstream media. It's mostly all reading, so I have to interpret this. And uh, I even <laughs> Googled it to see those little pronunciation guides. Apparently, it's a Brazilian name. That's a fun fact for you guys. But people on you know both sides of both Republicans and Democrats now uh, seem to be calling for Devin Nunes to step down because he met with a source at the White House to look at some documents and some evidence that supported Trump's claim about wiretapping. Now, <laughs> they're saying that this somehow disqualifies him, that he took this meeting with this source uh, and, and now he's he's tainted. And, you know, I let me just say, I, I don't understand the media's interpretation of what people should or shouldn't do in this circumstance. A former uh, security officer, you know, somebody that was working for the intelligence community said that they don't actually have access to the information that he would need to see from, you know, where, where the chairman is positioned. So essentially, he had to go to the White House to see this information, the secure content that would now, you know, help with his investigation into whether or not Trump colluded with Russia, which I don't even understand why we're still talking about. Uh, you know, Comey even said when he did his investigation, it doesn't look like anybody did anything wrong leading into this. Flynn didn't do anything wrong leading into this. How long is this going to go on? This utter nonsense, this this distraction that's just theater, distract people from what else is going on. It's just another defamation tactic. And there's more important things you can attack Trump on. Like, if you're the Democrats, I don't understand the strategy here of just attacking this inconsequential garbage. I mean, actually, I, that's not true. I do understand the strategy. The strategy is that they know most people are morons. Most people are not going to look at what's actually going on. So it's much easier to have the flapping Russia bird in the corner where people go, oh, I don't know that Trump is colluding with Russia. And you've got idiots like Rachel Maddow on MSNBC talking about Russia for 25 minutes before revealing Trump's non-tax return uh, scandal. So, I mean, I guess I do understand it, but I mean, I just I 
I love how they're trying to find any reason where Nunes comes out and says, well, it looks like there's actually some evidence to support Trump's claim that Obama wiretapped him. And it's not just him recently saying this. I mean, this is the most recent confirmation. But you look at the just look at the track record here. You've got these FISA courts and the, the public record where you can see what was approved and what wasn't approved through the Information Act. We got these records that says Obama did wiretap the Trump Tower. He got approval finally after being rejected twice. They did wiretap people at the Trump Tower. I, I don't know what how much more evidence you need than than actual government court documents that show this happened. But then you also take a step back and you go, OK, well, all of the media that has been saying that, oh, there's no way Barack Obama would wiretap Trump. All of the media has also been reporting at the same time they gleefully jumped on every single report that came out about Michael Flynn. You know, he got torn down real fast for his alleged collusion with Russia, which, again, was proven to be innocent and (laughs) seems to be the proper thing to do. If you feel like there's somebody if if you're working for a team that may take over at the most powerful nation in the entire world, you would think you might want to talk to one of your biggest competitors uh, and try to work some things out in advance of, of taking office to make that transition a little bit smoother. But that's neither here nor there. He didn't do anything wrong. And we know he was wiretapped because all of the leaks that came out were from wiretaps. There's no other way that information would come out. It was leaked to the media from the intelligence community, which had been monitoring a private citizen, which is illegal unless you get actual warrants to do it, which I didn't. I still haven't seen any. Not even in the FISA court, but apparently maybe that's what that's what uh, old Barry O was was looking to do. So we know it happened. Yet. (laughs) Because of the partisanship going on, they have to attack Nunes now. And they have to latch on to this inconsequential meeting that he took, which had a perfectly legitimate purpose, which is just for him to look at some documents showing that there was evidence to support Trump's claim. And naturally, you know, it's because these sources that Nunes got this new information from, the, the mainstream media, the mainstream liberal media, and the Democrats are attacking the anonymous source of this information, which I honestly, I'm sorry, if, if the information is true, and I thought this during the WikiLeaks as well, if the information is true, the source of the information doesn't matter in any way. If it's anonymous, it's anonymous. If it's not, it's not. If the, if the facts are the facts, it does not matter worth a damn. But the double standard has once again reared its head when it comes to this information. And I love how going off this topic into another one seamlessly, (laughs) uh, there's another topic which cracked me up immensely regarding Trump. Uh, And this this is a story where Trump allegedly met with Angela Merkel, uh, Germany's chancellor, and allegedly handed her a bill for the cost of NATO that Germany has uh, Germany back, basically their back owed payments to NATO. Now, when I saw that, I wanted it to be true just so badly. I mean, I, 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 if I had the choice between getting an extra Christmas present this year or having Trump hand Angela Merkel a bill for some $300 billion for all the money Germany was supposed to pay in to NATO for defense and has it done, I would definitely take Trump handing her that bill because I think it's absolutely hilarious and brilliant. And let's be honest, I'd like to see more of that. I would love it. If Trump did that, I'd love it if he went to every single member of NATO and handed him a bill. I mean, look, the government, (laughs) our government and our taxpayer money and uh, and all the other money that they steal away from us through business and regulation and all these other nefarious ways to uh, to keep growing the government. They are paying. We are paying for this NATO organization in which the government, the U.S. government is the go to to stop anything and everything. I mean, you look at every single war, every single action that's taken, the troops that get sent out, it's about 90 percent Americans in these coalitions, 90 percent of our troops, our tanks, our aircraft. And then you've got basically 10 percent of support teams coming in from other nations. 
Now, not to demean the soldiers from those other nations. I'm not trying to say that what they're doing isn't valuable to whatever cause we're doing. I'm not saying it's moral, by the way, because I think a lot of the actions taken under NATO are also immoral. But if, if you've got these, these troops coming there, you know they're not doing the heavy lifting. They might take some patrols, but a lot of time, like, you know, you've got the Australian military in there. Australia's crack troops. What are they doing? I'm sure they're they're fixing cars. They're setting up tents. I mean, America is doing all the heavy lifting. And for Trump, I mean, it would not surprise me. He's got the balls to do it. But for Trump to do something like that, I don't think would be out of uh, out of the question. I don't think it would be improper. If somebody owes you money and has owed you money for a very long time and in increasing amounts, why should you not ask them to pay up on that cash? You don't know it just to, you know, to the agreement you signed. You owe it to the American people to ask that. So all the media, anyway, all the media, they jumped on this story like a hot potato. They just, you know, like ravenous wolves. They said, oh, this is so great. That's just because Trump's such a, such a buffoon. How uncouth of him. So they jump on this story, which, of course, was reported initially in a British newspaper from who? Who? Two anonymous sources. But the media had no problem with that. No, no, the, there's there is no issue citing anonymous sources for a uh, quasi ridiculous rumor about Trump handing Angela Merkel a $300 billion bill for NATO costs. But it did not stop hundreds of articles from shooting out at light speed all over our Internet. So I mean, the one I was looking at was from Politico, and it was reporting it as if it was straight fact. And yet you find out a little bit later that, whoops, oh, it's actually probably fake news. But everybody that's supposedly uh, mainstream media, they covered it. They jumped all over it. White House issued a statement saying, no, <laughs> absolutely not. We did actually, we actually did not hand Angela Merkel a $300 billion bill. And uh, again, all fake news. So I uh, just going back, you know, I mentioned this last week with the Andrew Napolitano uh, allegations that British sources inside of the intelligence department had told him that it was actually the Brits that facilitated all the information passed to Obama about Trump because they have access to the same NSA information. So he gets fired. Meanwhile, different anonymous source, different day, whole different outlook on life. Just, it, it makes me absolutely sick. And this is why I just can't, I have such an issue following any mainstream media outlets. I will admit once in a while, I'll flip on uh, Fox News, you know, watch Kennedy. Uh, I'll flip on Varney and Company in the morning between my SpongeBob SquarePants. <laughs> I love to watch. But for the most part, I just can't take it. It's just uh, there's no value in it. Um, you know, it is essentially it's, it's if it's not propaganda bought and paid for by the government, as I discussed in last show about the Smith Month Act, it is propaganda being forced down our throats from either the liberals or conservative elite and either way it can't be trusted it's uh it's if you're a fan of the golden child of eddie murphy it's like you're eating the porridge and then there's some blood on the bottom of the damn bowl so we're just gobbling it up all together all right next thing let's get into Rand paul's statements on nato following up the uh, the trump news because good old randy pants had some great statements about Montenegro, which just was approved to join NATO. And let me quote Rand here real quick for you. Today, the question is, will we add another commitment to defend yet another foreign country? Paul asked. For decades, NATO has been an organization where the U.S. disproportionately spends our blood and our treasure. The other NATO or countries have largely hitched a ride on a U.S. train that subsidizes their defenses and allows them to direct their revenues to their own domestic concerns. In short, Paul said, Uncle Sam is the Uncle Patsy for the rest of the world. And he then uh, offered an amendment up that said that even if Montenegro were admitted to NATO, Congress has to debate and vote on a formal declaration of war before sending American troops to defend the small Eastern European nation. Now, clearly... This is a bonus. And really, Rand Paul has been knocking it out of the ballpark uh, lately with his opposition to the ACA. Uh, or actually, not the, well, his, number one, his opposition to the ACA, but then his opposition to Trump Care or whatever Paul Ryan had renamed this, this act, the American Health Care Act, I think, the AHA. 
aha, it's still garbage. That's what I thought to myself when I heard the name. But for Rand to stop, uh, step up here and, and fight against this, uh, you know, because I'm sure all of the other all the other uh, representatives that we've got are probably like, oh, no, let them in. You know, they don't. we want to all be friends. We don't want to disallow anybody. Now, remember, Montenegro has been war-torn for quite some time. That is not the case immediately at the moment, but it is adding another nation that is, let's just say, prone to fits of aggression with their neighbors. So the odds of the U.S. being drawn into a conflict there are not small. Um, you know, there's, I would say there's a pretty decent chance that that could happen. And again, shipping our troops across the world, going into Eastern Europe, risking their lives, spending more money. And for what? How much is Montenegro? I mean, look, well, let's be honest. Montenegro is a, a tiny place. How much really is Montenegro going to put into the NATO budget here? Their tiny economy. Almost nothing. I mean, if, for them to expect the U.S. to fly over there, because whatever we do, you know, the U.S. goes big, go big or go home. So whatever we do, it's going to be a heavy investment of time and money and troops and blood. And, and Montenegro's return on that is negligible. What are they? How exactly are they going to help the rest of NATO? Let me ask you that. Nobody seems to ask that question. Everybody says, yeah, let them in. But how, what, I mean, isn't the point of this organization that everybody helps each other out? You know, it's a, yeah, we can all defend each other. We can all work with each other. Montenegro is bringing nothing to the table. <laughs> I just, I don't get it. You know, if you're, if you're filming, if you're going to form a group, let's say you've got a, uh, a whole community, you're like, all right, we're going to build a group of, of business leaders, people that are real forward looking leaders of tomorrow, you know, this private, this private group to all help each other out. And you know what? Just for the hell of it, let's let in this homeless man that smells like urine. <laughs> what, what's he going to bring to the table? Nothing. All he's going to do is beg for money the whole time. Steal food out of the fridge when you're not looking. It's just ridiculous. It, it's essentially letting Montenegro and these other little tiny nations in here. It is simply charity. It is another form of foreign aid, which I hate. And I know Rand Paul hates. And even Donald Trump hates because he reigned in foreign aid. And again, this NATO is the biggest foreign aid organization out there. Hands down, period. And the U.S. is funding the majority of it. So for all you people whining and crying about our foreign aid uh, and all the money that we're that we're cutting back on and not giving to other countries, don't worry. NATO's doing it in spades. But the difference, of course, is that one foreign aid, for all intents and purposes, is theoretically going to pay for food. This type of foreign aid is going to uh, to murder people in other nations and uh, and possibly lose the lives of our own troops. So, yeah. Um, the other thing I want to talk about too, in, uh, regards to good old, uh, Randy, Randy pants is that he is uh, crowing around the, uh, the Washington circles and rightly so about the freedom caucus and their success in stopping Paul Ryan's plan because he called it Obamacare light. I mean, this, I mean, that, that pretty much nailed it. Except in fact, I would, I would argue that it's even worse than Obamacare because you've got all of the liabilities that are still involved with Obamacare, basically there's subsidies built into it. Instead of getting the Obamacare style tax subsidies, you get tax credit, but it's still, it's not the same type of tax credit that Rand wants to propose where it's a straight deduction. This is that you get paid out and you still get paid out whether or not you paid taxes in or not under the, the Ryan plan, which is just stupid. So thank God it failed. All it would have done is continue to raise premiums and uh, help nothing basically because everybody that has insurance still still keeps their insurance except they penalize you if you drop insurance so while you're not mandated to buy insurance like you are under obamacare you get penalized if you drop it thus they're still saying like you have to get insurance so again people are either being forced in a, a sneaky way to stay on there or you can still say okay well fine i'm young and i'm healthy and i'm going to drop this this care but then you know, for the number of people that do that, who's going to fund these other premiums? Who's going to fund these other people that are that are driving the premiums up in the first place? We saw under Obamacare where they have a mandate forcing people to buy health care to cover those people and how that did not work whatsoever. Uh, I was just reading a Forbes article, which basically said that, you know, people are saying, well, uh, you know, premiums are going to go up either way, regardless of the ACA. 
But this article points out it makes it very, very clear that the premiums went up as a result of Obamacare. There's no real way to argue against that. And they went up not a small amount. I mean, the, on average, it was saying that over the course of the last couple of years since the ACA took place, they went up between 46 percent and 66 percent. I mean, that is madness. It's just <laughs> my God. And they said they, they did a little contradiction or a little uh, comparison here before the ACA took place. The, a lot of these programs, they went up somewhere between 4% and 15% in the four years preceding Obamacare. After that, it was 46% for, that is for the HMOs and PPOs went up 66%. That is sheer madness. And there's just no way if you're, I'm sorry, if you're a liberal in America, and you're still defending Obamacare and arguing that, well, you know, it's for the greater good because these people that can't afford coverage can get coverage. And, you know, everybody else has just got to chip in their share. I don't see how you can legitimately look at these numbers and argue that it's still something that should be done. When you see a person who's got a family of four, like there's another thing in this article, a family of four, it used to be some $2,500 a year for health care. And now it's $12,000 a year. So essentially, you're you're telling me that people can just afford ten thousand extra dollars a year for health care, and they're still going to be able to pay for it, just so we can cover some of the people that, while tragic, that they have you know these these pre existing conditions, or they've got certain types of cancer that cropped up and they didn't have insurance. Because remember, these people chose not to have insurance. Your insurance provider typically cannot kick you off. You know, if you develop cancer, they can't kick you off for that. So these people chose not to have insurance, and now they're, they they got stuck, and we're forced to pay for them. And this family of four now looks at their bills, and they go, I can't pay this. So what happens? Probably the the patriarch or matriarch of the family chooses to, chooses to say, okay, well, I will forgo my own health insurance then to pay for my children. That's typically probably what would happen. And again, these are for individuals. A lot of the health care through uh, businesses is heavily subsidized or they have taxes. So they're not paying as much, but the individuals in the country are still getting hit. And I know looking at my, I mean, my, my uh, healthcare is paid for by my business, but at the same time, it still went up. Uh, I would say a good 35%. So we got to get rid of this thing somehow. I'm hoping that Rand's plan is still viable, but at this point, after Ryan's sound defeat, despite the fact that Rand was so integral in that defeat, uh, he and the Freedom Caucus, I don't think they're going to turn to Rand's plan, even though it makes the most sense to me by far of all the plans out there by still allowing people that have the pre-existing conditions to keep their insurance. To, you know, it's, it basically, it was like you have a two-year window where you keep your insurance and then you they can't kick you off, you know, or you can buy in if you have a pre-existing condition. This two-year period is your window. Get in now. And then after that, tough tots. You had your opportunity, which I think is fine. And he also does a good job with tax credits, healthcare savings plans. So I like Rand Paul's plan quite a bit. And he's also opens up the borders so you can buy insurance across state lines. Getting rid of this, you know, basically fighting back against uh, Rand's or I'm sorry, Ryan's plan, which has been stated is essentially just in bed with the insurance companies again, just like the ACA was this crony capitalism in the healthcare industry. So Rand's plan strikes back against that a little bit, at least. All right, let's take a quick break to hear from our sponsor. And then I will be back with a little bit of, I want to talk a little bit about the new Scarlett Johansson ghost in the shell movie. Not really anything libertarian in there. I just really don't like her. And, uh, and I want to talk about it. <laughs> And then I also want to talk about, actually, as something from my own personal uh, work life, a case I'm dealing with right now, which I think will be of great interest to libertarians, and uh, I want to tell you a little bit about it. So let's hear a word from the sponsor, and I will be right back. You know, I'm a freelancer, and I purchased my own health insurance, and I was hit by some serious sticker shock after the implementation of Obamacare. My premiums and deductibles were skyrocketing. And as someone who keeps myself pretty healthy, I knew that I was getting a raw deal for a product I simply didn't want. This caused me to seek an alternative, and I found an amazing alternative in the form of health sharing. A killer concept where healthy individuals 
agree to share their medical costs. That's right. It's a voluntary free market system for paying for your health care that also, thanks to an exemption, covers the Obamacare mandate. Our friends at Health Excellence Select have kicked it up a notch by creating a full service package to handle all of your health care needs. Trust me, I'm not just a proponent of health sharing. I'm also a client. This has been one of the greatest things I've ever done to leave the Obamacare system in favor of what our friends at Health Excellence Select are doing. To learn more, head over to lionsofliberty.com slash health. And don't hesitate to give my man Jeff Cantor a call at 440-283-684. Four nine. Be sure to mention Lions of Liberty. And I'm back. So let's do a little quick talk about Steve Bannon and his bashing of libertarians before I get into my uh, my rants on Scarlett Johansson here in a minute. Because I want to address this. Steve Bannon, he was profiled, I believe it was in New York Magazine. And yeah, New York Times Magazine. And he had some snide comments about a wee libertarian folk. So let me read this to you. And uh, we can all take a chuckle because he gets a quote wrong. He quotes it to Dostoevsky, yet it was actually from Tolstoy. Ha! You idiot! So here's the quote. He says, uh, he's, he's talking about identity politics and the difference between the uh, the parties. So he says, what's the Dostoevsky line? Happy families are all the same, but unhappy families are unhappy in their own unique ways. He meant Tolstoy. I think the Democrats are fundamentally afflicted with the inability to discuss and have adult conversation about economics and jobs because they're too consumed by identity politics. And then the Republicans, it's all this theoretical Cato Institute, Austrian economics, limited government, which just doesn't have any depth to it. They're not living in the real world. Now, of course, there's a lot wrong with that state. First things first. If anybody is grounded in the real world, I would argue that it's libertarians more than anybody. Because we look at the past 50 years of economics and what's worked and what hasn't worked. You've got the Democrats and Republicans who are all uh, Keynesian. So I'm guessing Bannon is signing up as a part of that, who he believes in the Fed, even though Donald Trump is already all for auditing the Fed. And which, by the way, a committee passed the audit the Fed, so it now has a better chance of passing in the House. It probably still won't, but just FYI. So Steve Bannon apparently is a fan of everything that's been going on, everything that has not worked, and that has been proven to fail over and over again, that has been proven to create bubbles in our economy that then drive things up and bring them down spectacularly when they crash. I mean, if anything, I, I will say this, it, more than more than him uh, taking knocks at the Cato Institute, which I really couldn't care that much about, uh, because Cato has several statist opinions, which I don't necessarily share. But, and also, I love how he calls it theoretical Cato Institute. Like, what are you talking about theoretical? Doing studies? Talking about economic models is theoretical? Talking about principles and how to apply them is theoretical? I- I- idiotic. But you look at all the different things that are going on in the market that have been going on with politics as far as virtually every single political theory or economic theory that's been put out there into the world and that they've tried to use. All of them have failed spectacularly. And when you're making a new predictive model, oftentimes they'll look backwards and try to match it to the forecasts of the past and say, well, you see, if you apply our economic model, it it, it matches if you go backwards with it. Just like they do the same thing with climate science. They go, well, you know, the, the climate science models, they match. If we look at the historical precedents and we match our forecasting model up with it, it matches up. That's what these, these, these Keynesians do. Meanwhile, they can't forecast anything looking forward. They can't plan anything appropriately looking forward because they're messing with the marketplace. Just let the marketplace work. That's the Austrian model. Let it work. Look at the market forces. Let them work it out within the market itself. Keep the Fed out of it. Keep the government influence out of it. And you have a much better chance of avoiding bubbles that way. But Steve Bannon doesn't seem to understand that, despite the fact that Austrian economics has far more evidence to support the fact that it actually works and is a sound economic model and theory than does the Keynesian hypothesis and meddling constantly with what's going on in the marketplace. It just it baffles my mind. You know, Steve Bannon, I never thought was a dumb guy, but now I'm starting to question that. For two reasons. Number one. I always think that dumb people throw out a lot of quotes from other people smarter than them. It's a way to look smart. You quote somebody, sounds like you know what you're talking about. You probably don't. And number two, of course, if you don't learn anything from history, if you don't have enough cognitive ability to look at what's going on in the world 
extrapolate what's true and what's not true from that when you've got clear evidence in front of you, then I don't know how to reach you. The same thing was going on in our foreign policy forever. Okay, so let's see. Uh, let's go over. Let's mess with these people because, you know, it's basically look at uh, the economic uh, attack that we're taking is very similar to our foreign policy when you really think about it. We want to go over and meddle with something. We want to influence it to adjust the future to make sure that we avoid this thing blowing up in our face. So we go, we mess with it. And what happens? It blows up in our face. The same thing happens with the bubbles and the Fed and the actions there. Same thing happens with the the, uh, Keynesian model, as happens with foreign policy. Literally the same. I don't know why I've never noticed before. Because it's the same people in charge that believe that they can control the future, that they control the actions of people better than the market can, or better than just letting people live their lives can. People are going to do what they're going to do. And no matter how much of influence you try to put on them, they're still going to do that. And in fact, they're probably going to have the opposite reaction. Just like we look at with economic shortages where they put price controls into place. What happens? The exact opposite of what's supposed to happen. Instead, you put price controls on something, that commodity gets even scarcer because now everybody clamors to afford it. There's no market for, market correction whatsoever. In our foreign policy, we go overseas, we try to correct what they're doing, but <laughs> excuse me, but they push back even harder. It just is, it's so aggravating to see this. And, you know, Trump has said in the past some kind things about libertarians. Steve Bannon clearly could give zero dams about us, which, uh, which is troubling because we had all hoped in some way, shape, or form. I know Lou Rockwell, uh, most prominent of all as a libertarian for Trump guy, but we had all hoped that Trump might have some libertarian values to him. I still do hold out some hope for that. But clearly, if Steve Bannon has his closest ear, then uh, libertarians are not going to be too happy over the next few years. So, all right, let's move on to something else that's uh, a little bit more upbeat. So let's talk a little bit about Ghost in the Shell, which is an anime cartoon, which I really love, actually. It's uh, quite good. Uh, it takes place in the future, as one would imagine. And involves a uh, yeah, sexy little, <laughs> sexy little anime girl as an ass kicking major in a special forces unit for I believe it's future Tokyo, but I could be wrong about that. Uh, but you know it's been around for a while. Very famous. Had a original original series and movie, and then it had some other ones that, that followed up, uh, which are on Netflix. I think Ghost in the Shell Standalone Complex One, Two, and Three is on there. But it's interesting. And in fact, ties in a little bit to uh, Mark Clear's interview with uh, Zoltan Istvan, who uh, has a whole you know transhumanist movement he's very passionate about. He's a libertarian that's running for office right now. And I will link to that interview as well. And uh, Zoltan, so he is, you know, his thing, he wants to talk about how technology and humanity are going to be merging together soon, which is inevitable. We're already seeing it happen. Uh, you're going to see augmented reality become a big part of our, our existence that much. I promise you with Google Glass and everything else. Now, Google Glass failed, but there's going to be more things that happen with implants like Zoltan himself. He's got an implant in his hand that allows him to uh, <laughs> open up his car door, get into his apartment, open up little keys. If he forgets his keys and goes surfing, all this kind of stuff. So Ghost in the Shell takes that a step farther and essentially presents a world in which humans and mechanics are merged. Uh, you essentially can transfer your body and your soul into a, a, a cyborg body and then go around and you have all these upgrades. And, you know, so you have a world where the base there's base humans that have transferred into these cyborg bodies. And then you've got the elite, which have much nicer cyborg bodies. And then you've got the government which has even nicer cyborg bodies, and they've got all the military upgrades, etc., which are not easily available to the general populace. Very similar to as the item I discussed several shows ago, and I've referenced several times with uh, the Fourth Circuit Court of Appeals ruling that, quote-unquote, military-style weapons were not available to the public, because why would they need them? Similar circumstance with the cyber bodies up here. They <laughs> got all these upgrades that uh, people can't get because, hey, why would you need to have uh, the same bodies as the government people? They get all the advantages, including the super camouflage. So in this world, you've got this government organization, which is fighting essentially against cyber attacks because everybody's their their minds are embedded in these robot bodies or they're in the cloud. So you've got a lot of cyber hacking going on. It's kind of inception type thing where they'll jack into people and then rob their minds of, of info. Uh, <laughs> harkening back a little bit to the Johnny Mnemonic Keanu Reeves film, which is not a great film, but uh, I have a, a secret crush on, on Keanu because he's such a nice guy. 
But you've got this world where, where all this is going on. Now, you know, there's there's a little bit uh, from a libertarian perspective, I guess, to talk about there, as I just discussed, and the battle between people for what what they should or should not be able to do and how much access the government has and can they hack into people's individual minds, uh, that kind of thing. But more than that, I just I just got to say, I am driven up the wall by Scarlett Johansson. And seeing this movie come out where, you know, it really should be a Japanese lead in it, despite the fact that I acknowledge wholeheartedly there, the accusations of whitewashing when it comes to anime cartoons is largely ridiculous. Because when you look at anime characters, they're not driven, they're not uh, drawn like the Japanese. There's, and the ones that are, you can tell are supposed to be Asian. They draw the eyes very differently. They're drawn for the most part as if they are white. They have big eyes, they got white skin, they got red hair, they're not supposed to be Asian. So people saying, oh, this is whitewashing, you're just full of it. And it also reminds me of that whole big, I think it was Vogue, did a photo spread where a white American model posed and dressed up as a geisha, essentially, and people, all these Asian groups were saying, oh my God, I can't believe they did this. This is outrageous. This is, this is cultural appropriation. It wasn't. If anything, it was an homage to Japanese culture. And that's what people need to stop and, and just shut the F up about. Notice how I'm not cursing? Huh? Two episodes in a row, guys. But they need to shut the F up about this because there's a difference when everybody wants to have this global society. You know, all these liberals, they say, oh, we want to have everybody getting along. And, and it's a one world. Yet, as soon as you try to embrace another culture, they accuse you of cultural appropriation. <laughs> How's that for irony? How exactly are we supposed to have all one culture if we're not allowed to look or touch or take from any other culture? Which, by the way, is how progress is made. I've said this before. Instead of fighting wars all over the place, people adopting culture is how actual change happens and how progress is made. How you, how you find things in common is by cultures trading with each other. And that doesn't, doesn't mean goods. That means cultural concepts. That means ways of dressing, ways of speaking, ways of interacting. So... By doing this modeling shoot where she's dressed as a geisha, there's no problem with that. It's not quote unquote yellow face. It's just it's paying homage to the history of Japan. And it was set in a, like a historical setting. And I also saw they did a whole collection of reactions from Japanese people reacting to American outrage from these liberal, <laughs> liberal uh, social justice warriors. And they couldn't understand it. They said, this is wonderful. This looks like a great. This is, this is a great uh, photo. It looks like they're embracing our cultural heritage. What's wrong with this? This is fantastic. And the Japanese have embraced a lot of American, uh, well, obviously because we conquered them and uh, took away all of their weaponry for a long time. But, you know, Japanese people obviously embraced a lot of American culture. And they took a lot from us. Are we upset by that? No. Of course not. Why would we be? But people were very upset about Scarlett Johansson being in this film. Now, I'm also upset about it, but for different reasons. I'm upset about it because, number one, the movie looks like a big, fat turd. As soon as anybody sees it, they're going to go, oh, oh, lordy, why? Oh, lordy, why? And Scarlett Johansson, by the way, worst selection. I know she's built, I, I don't know how, but she's built up now a reputation for being a female action hero. Despite the fact that action has the word act in it, and she can't act. She was in that movie, Lucy, where she took, you know, whatever, some super smart pill that made her the, the coolest, smartest, fastest person in the world. And I was like, OK, Luce, so your IQ is 250 now, but you still can't act. Terrible. If I want to talk to some dullard on the street, I'll go find some, you know, somebody that's done way too much LSD. That's what she sounds like all the time. She sounds like she's just really high. Like, super stoned, just ate an entire bag of Oreos. Like, hey, I'm Scarlet. Scarlet Joe, you better stop what you're doing there. I'm Black Widow. I'm going to kick your butt with my guns. As soon as these quaaludes wear off. But I'm always on. Black Widow, by the way, dumbest Avengers character ever. Dumber than Hawkeye and his stupid arrows. At least the arrows do something different. Huh? <laughs> At least the arrows. You got a fire arrow. You got a, you got like a glue arrow. You got the underage sex arrow that Hawkeye just shoots from a rooftop as two underage kids are about to have, have sex the first time. He just slaps a condom on a guy. You know that one? He's got one for the diaphragm on it. 
But he's got different arrows, is the point. Scarlet Chance, what do you do? Oh, you, you get it, you get it shooting guns? Yeah, that's great. Let's put you in the Avengers. It makes a lot of sense. But she's got this dull, stupid voice. She like, it's not like she, I don't understand. People think she's sexy. I why? Why? Why do people think she's sexy? Because she has big breasts? Because you look at her face, she's got like her, her eyes are are closed 90% of the time. Her mouth's just hanging open, drooling 90% of the time. I I don't get it. And it makes me so angry that she keeps getting cast in movies. <laughs> I don't get it, people. Okay, enough of that tangent. Uh, let's wrap the show up by talking about this case that I'm working on. So as many of you know, some of you might not know, I work in public relations uh, as of right now until this podcasting thing really tests off. But I work in public relations as a career. And typically, I would not take this kind of account. But uh, a very nice man reached out to us. And essentially, what here's, this, here's his story. His name's Rami Avraham. And um, I will link to, as of right now, the only media that's covered his story, which to me has been incredibly frustrating because <laughs> basically my client has taken a hunger strike. He's sitting outside of the Santa Monica courthouse here in Los Angeles, and he's been on hunger strike. As of today, it'll be two weeks in. Two weeks. And I have been pitching his story for two weeks, and the media have completely ignored it. I know they're opening the emails, but they just will not send crews out. They will not send reporters out except one outlet, which did a nice video story, which I will share. Now, Rami's story, here is what happened. He's been in divorce court, or he was in divorce court for some seven years, going back and forth with his wife. And in California especially, men get just screwed in divorce court. It doesn't matter that Rami, he's been here for 30 years. He's an immigrant from Israel. He barely speaks English well. I will. I mean, it is tough. Hard to understand him. It's hard for him to communicate well. Pigeon English. But he's a great guy. Very sweet man. So Rami has been in divorce court. He had an agreement with his wife, who's also from Israel, that they would split their assets down the middle. They had this agreement before they went to court. They weren't splitting up in a bad way. You know, they had this agreement. They wanted to do it, do what was right for their kids, etc. So Rami, from all his plumbing work, and his wife never worked a day, but for almost plumbing work, he had accrued a, uh, they had a beautiful house. They had several apartment buildings that they owned together jointly that they were renting out. And, you know, they had some money, obviously, in the bank. So despite having this arrangement, they go to court. And the first thing the judge does is he takes the, okay, well, they have this agreement. Well, write up a new agreement and, uh, you know, t- t- leave out all the boilerplate language that would add anything on. So this is what this the, his order to uh to her lawyer. But what happens is that all that boilerplate language that California loves that screws men over gets left in there. So instead of the prearranged agreement where they're splitting everything, instead what happens is that Rami's wife gets the house, which she gets to live in as well. Now they now they're supposed to split the mortgage on the house until they sell it, but she's going to get all the proceeds from the house when they sell it. So she doesn't even pay her side of the mortgage. So what happens, the house goes into foreclosure. Rami now has to buy it out of foreclosure. So so remember that. So she gets the house. She also gets awarded sole ownership of another apartment building that they had co-owned. So sells that for a pretty penny. She gets all of the money from that. They have a third apartment building, which they didn't want to sell. And yet the court forced them to sell. So that's gone. They split the proceeds from that. But here's the kicker, too. She had gotten granted. Rami says this this wasn't true, but her lawyer stated that she had been granted innocent spouse status. And the judge in the case, who was very biased against my client, he said, "Okay, yeah, yeah, no, that's fine. So by granting her innocent spouse status from the IRS, that means that she didn't have to pay any taxes. So not only did they give her All of the property, she gets to keep all of the money from the sales of the property, but also Rami has to pay all of the taxes for the buildings that she gets all the money from. In what world is that a fair deal? And wait, there's more. Because here's the real kicker to all this. 
So Rami, after a while, he gets fed up and he sees he's not going to get a fair shake in court. This judge is just, he's, he does not like him. He doesn't like his lawyer. And his lawyer was trying to do his best to, to fight. And, and yeah, I'm reading the court transcripts. I have all the court transcripts, uh, which if you guys are curious, you can go to justiceforavraham.weebly.com, which I'll also link to. And you can read all the transcripts. There's a lot. I read about 400 pages of transcripts. But you can see his lawyer just in shock at some of the rulings that are being passed down and some of the evidence that's being passed down. Um, and so Rami, he finally says, I, I can't take it anymore. I'm gonna, I got I to gotta fight back in one way or the other. So he's got a plumbing truck. He puts a placard on the plumbing truck, which has, you know, his website, Justice for Abraham, and says, essentially, and I'm going to paraphrase it slightly here, but it says, if Commissioner St. George, who's the judge, is not going to follow the law, I will do my best to enforce the law on him. Now, that is not threatening in any way. That is simply saying that he feels like the commissioner isn't obeying the laws that are on the books. He's being unfair and that he's, and Rami's going to try to fight back for his rights and he's going to try to use the law. <laughs> That's the thing. Enforce the law on him. He's going to use the law to try to fight, fight back against this, this biased judge. So the judge hears of this, this public campaign, which is protected first amendment speech. Hears about this public campaign in the courtroom says that, Oh yeah, you know, well, you know, I heard about this campaign, but I'm thinking about having sheriffs patrol around my house to protect me. Because people like him, everyone says they're a little crazy. Next thing you know, they get a gun and shoot a bunch of people, or they kill me or my family. A sitting judge said that in a courtroom to my client. To on a case that he's he's supposed to be an unbiased adjudicator for he's supposed to decide and, and and award monetary funds in millions of dollars. And he said that in a courtroom based upon a placard, a simple placard trying to push back against him. I can't tell you how outraged I am about this. And I, and this is why I'm so frustrated that media won't cover it. And I even said it over to Reason. I said, hey, Reason, why don't you give this a shot? You know, I know Brian Doherty read it, calling you out, Doherty. Yet nobody will cover this, this issue. And he's been on hunger strike for two weeks now. In what world do we live in where a judge can slander somebody in a courtroom with no basis whatsoever, accuse him of being a terrorist, accuse him of being a danger to society, and still get to keep his job sitting and judging that same case? I just don't know. We talk about the overreach of the court system. We talk about abuse of power in the court system. Now, this is a smaller abuse of power than the ones that occur in the U.S. Court of Appeals, where they affect all of us, or judicial advocacy, where they're just advocating for their own personal views. Now, this judge also is advocating for his personal view that he just doesn't like my client, that he believes wholeheartedly that women should get all the money despite not having to work. But I just pray that this gets some more media attention. Uh, for my, not, not just for my client's sake, but for the sake of the state of law in this country. Because when you can have judges make statements like that, something is seriously wrong, where there's no comeuppance. And he's he has pushed back. He's gone through every single court, every single avenue to try to get this judge removed, and they just simply won't do it. So... Ah, my man, Rami. Guys, that'll wrap it up for today. Hopefully the show wasn't too incoherent again. My morning shows are probably not as good as my evening shows, but uh, we'll see how it turns out. So that'll do it. Uh, guys, reminder, please do, if you enjoy this podcast or any of our other podcasts, please do go to iTunes. Give us a nice review there. It greatly helps us. We're trying to grow this show, as you know. And uh, thank you all, by the way, who supported the show so far. We're getting more people uh, signing on and, and supporting us through Podbean and, and buying the products. So thank you so much. That really does help us and what we're trying to do for this program, make things better and better. And hope we get to the point where I have some more time. I can take a day off somewhere to have more time to record these podcasts. But please do give us a review there. Like I said earlier in the show, follow us on all of our social media platforms. Please tell a friend to check us out. Share it far and wide. Thank you. So from me, 
from Electric Liberty Land. Always stay plugged in to Liberty.